Well, hey everybody, it's great to see you today. Thanks so much for joining us for Heartland Church Online. Whether you're joining us on Facebook, YouTube, or the Church Online platform, I want to invite you to fully engage in the next 60 minutes. I want to invite you to, to chat in the chat feature. I want to invite you to shoot us an email at info at Heartland Sun Prairie. If you have questions or any need in any way, shape, or form, don't hesitate to let us know. This is an opportunity for all of us, no matter where we are in life or even in our community, this is an opportunity for us to refocus our hearts and our minds on the things that matter most. And so I pray that this next hour will be a blessing to you. Brent and the team are going to begin our time together today by leading us in worship and reading some scripture. And so right now, I want to hand things over to him. The Lord is gracious and righteous. Our God is compassionate. The Lord guards the inexperienced. I was helpless and he saved me. Return to your rest, my soul, for the Lord has been good to you. For you, Lord, rescued me from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I was buried beneath my shame And who could carry that kind of a weight It was my tomb Till I met you And I was breathing but not Alive, all my failures I tried to hide. It was my turn till I met you. You call my name. Oh, 
Yeah. 
All right, well, I want to say a special welcome to anybody who's joining us for the first time. If you have never been to a Heartland service here in the building with us, I am so honored and so glad that you're cho- choosing to join us for an online church service. And just want to invite you to get connected, to take a next step in your Heartland journey. When you're ready to do that, you can do it a couple of ways. You can click on the digital connect card in the chat room. You can also shoot us a text by simply saying, Uh, Heartland Connect, all one word, Heartland Connect, to the number 33777, and our team will respond right away and uh, help you take a next step in your Heartland journey. Well, at this point in the service, I want to say a special thank you to anyone who has been supporting the ministry of the church financially. We recognize that we could not do what we are currently doing if it were not for so many of us who are pulling our resources together and continuing to worship God with our finances, continuing to trust him with our stuff materially, and to know that this is really what we get to invest in. We get to invest in in people's lives. We get to invest in our community, and we get to invest in what God is doing eternally through this place even electronically. That is such an incredible thought. We've said from the very beginning that the church is not a building, but the church is all of us. And so even while we're not meeting together in the building, the church is still alive and well. The church continues to thrive and the church continues to function and it continues to do ministry. And so to tell you about some of those ministries, we've got some of the teams spread out and they're going to take the opportunity right now to tell you some more about what is going on here at Heartland. Take a look. Well, it might be hard to believe, but Mother's Day is right around the corner. Next Sunday, we are going to be celebrating all the moms and people who have mothered us in our lives. Uh, and so we would love to do something special in, our, in the countdown and in this kind of part after our services. We would love to just highlight the Heartland moms. And, and whether you have little kids or grown kids or anywhere in between, send us a picture of you and your kids uh, so that we can feature you and just take a look at all the Heartland moms here around Heartland. You can email us, info at heartlandsunprairie.com. You can also shoot us a message on Facebook, Instagram, or if you want to, I guess, drop something off uh, and go old school, that's fine too. But, we, but if you could get us those early this week by Wednesday, then we can uh, feature you in our services next week. For those that don't know, Night to Remember is a prom-like experience that we host every year for individuals with special needs in the greater Madison area. It's something that we've done for many, many years at Heartland. It's one of our most favorite events and a lot of Heartlanders get involved. This year's event was scheduled for June 14th and we were preparing for one of our best and biggest nights of the year with over 200 guests already signed up. That's right. Unfortunately, because of the extension of the safer at home order, we had to make the really difficult decision to cancel this year's event. We are sad to say the least. And we knew as a team when we talked about it that our guests would be sad too. So when our team got together to plan what's next, we decided that we couldn't let the year go by without doing something to celebrate our guests because that's what we do and that's what we're about. And so we are thrilled to announce that on June 14th, the same day that Night to Remember was going to be, we are hosting a Day to Remember, and we are bringing the party to our guests. We will have a small team visiting our guests' home to deliver the party box and have a mini dance party. Cue the music, Blessin. Why are you dancing? It's on June 14th, not... Today. Well, hopefully he put some music behind that, or that's not going to look good. Okay, well, not going to look good. Now, while the event won't be the same as our big event, we still think this is going to be a really special experience for our guests. And it just might be the most epic thing we have done yet. It might be. And while we'd love for everyone to join our party crews, for safety reasons, we unfortunately can't. But there are ways that you can get involved. So first, the party boxes that Jake talked about cost $40 for us to assemble and fill with all the fun things for our guests. So if you'd like to contribute to that, you can head to ntrheartland.com, that's ntrheartland.com, and there's a place there that you can donate and help us put together all the boxes. Yep. Next, we'd love to include a handwritten note or a card with each party box, because we just want our guests to know that they're loved and celebrated. Yes, like one of those. So. If you'd like, you can purchase your own card, write a note in it, and make it in specific because just something that any of our guests would love to read. And then you can drop it in the mail to Night to Remember, 800 Wilburn Road, Sun Prairie. 
And finally, we wanna make June 14th truly a night to remember and celebratory for everyone. And that includes you. So we have a few ideas up our sleeves that we'll share more details about later on how you can be involved, you and your family can be involved from the safety of your own home and on social media. So I'm not gonna share a lot of details yet, but I just will say you might wanna dust off those dancing shoes. I'm already good to go. Yeah, I saw that. <clears throat> yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Well, thank you so much for continuing to support Night to Remember and this year's Day to Remember. Hey Heartland Women, this next Saturday on May 9th, we are gonna be having our May Gathering Point. We are gonna be doing this online and we can't wait to see you there. There's still time to get signed up, so head over to the website or to the app and sign yourself up. We are gonna be hearing on the topic of mental health. Sheree Milton is coming to speak to us and she is here with me right now. So Sheree, could you tell me a little bit about what we're gonna be hearing about? I would love to. I'm so excited to get to be a part of this and I'm so glad that we still get to offer it to you even though we can't be together in the new auditorium. I am really motivated about what God has put on my heart to share with you two main principles that have major impact on your mental health. They not only are backed up and confirmed through the Word of God, but they also have been shown by research and lots and lots of data to have a positive influence on what you're feeling inside. So tune in. You're not going to want to miss what those two focuses are. It's going to be a great Saturday together. We can't wait to see you there. All right, well today we are continuing in the Calm Teaching series that we've been in for the last couple of weeks. It has been a powerful series, and so if you've missed either of the first two parts, I want to encourage you to go back and get caught up by watching those. But today for part three, Dugan Sherbandi is going to continue unpacking this passage for us in the book of Philippians. If you would join me in praying right now, we will hand things over to him. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for the opportunity to do this. We're so grateful for the opportunity to gather remotely in your presence, Lord, to worship you and to now hear from you. And Lord, we pray that you would speak powerfully through Dugan today into each and every one of our lives. Lord, use this time to transform us more and more into the image of your son. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. And everyone who agreed said, amen. All right, well, good day, Heartland, and so glad you are joining us today. My name is Dugan Trabandi, and I'm so glad you are tuning in wherever you're watching from, on your phone or laptop or TV or BlackBerry, for the three of you that still have those, congratulations. Uh, so glad you're here joining us on this Sunday. As we continue in the series we are in called Calm, where we've been exploring this passage in Philippians, and each week we've kind of chosen one word that will, use, that will be an acronym spelling out the word calm to help us remember what God teaches us through the Apostle Paul about how to stay calm during these times of uncertainty and uncharted waters and confusion and sometimes stress and anxiety. We want to stay calm. So uh, week one, the word was celebrate, that we uh, during this time must celebrate. I encourage you to go watch John's teaching if you haven't about that. Last week, uh, we, the, the word was ask, and we talked about ask and submitting and surrendering all things to the Lord through prayer, that when we are anxious, we pray to him. And today, we're going to learn what the L stands for. I won't give it away, but that's what we're going to do. Uh, if you didn't have a chance last Monday to stop by and get your Calm bracelet, uh, feel free to uh, email info at heartlandsunprairie.com. We'd love to mail those to you so that you can wear your Calm bracelet and remind yourself how to stay calm through Philippians 4. Uh, before we jump into our passage today, I just thought we did this like a month ago and I thought it's time to do it again. Let's explore some more coronavirus jokes and memes and tweets. Um, once again, we are not making light of those who are dealing with stressful times. Of course, if we are praying uh, fervently for you and if there's anything we as a church, if you're in our community, can bless you with or serve you in any way, please let us know. But we also want to laugh and have fun because that's you know soothing to the soul and good to do. So I found some uh, COVID. 19 jokes and pic pictures and memes of people, you know, making the best of a bad situation that I wanted to share with you. Uh, the first comes from a Mexican restaurant in Texas. There's actually two from this company because they're great. They say, this too shall pass. It might pass like a kidney stone, but it will pass. <laughs> so there's the, there's the new t-shirt that you should wear on that. 
Uh, Next, a church, First Baptist Church, really nailing this one, says, give us clean hands, give us Purell hearts. Well done, double, double meaning, Baptist, First Baptist Church. Uh, next one is a guy who <laughs> says when your holiday has been canceled by the coronavirus, but you don't want to give up the dream. And on the left, it's like, yeah, cool, he made the flight. And on the right, he's holding what I hope is a new toilet seat. I'm really hoping he didn't like <laughs> unscrew that from his own toilet, but that's pretty creative. Uh, Next one, uh, (laughs) the way that dogs and cats would respond uh, to our quarantine, the dog article says, why not work from home forever? And the cat article says, America needs to get back to work because cats are mean, okay, and not as good as dogs. That's what that teaches you. So if you are between the two or on the fence, go dog. You don't have to gamble and hopefully not get a mean cat because they're all mean, okay? Don't write me and argue for your cat, okay? Because you're going to describe it exactly like a dog. And I'd be like, yeah, just go get any dog. In the- okay, anyway, I'm moving on. All right. Next one, again, from this Mexican restaurant, Texas, says, how's y'all summer's body looking? Mine looking like I have a great personality. <laughs> Love it. Quarantine 15, baby, that's out there. Oh, gosh, this tweet, made, this got me hard, you guys. I lol real hard uh, on my couch. Uh, this guy says, I like how ads have gone from buy a Toyota to this is a difficult and uncertain time for us all. Buy a Toyota. <laughs> Are you getting emails from weird companies like, we'll get through this together, insurance. And you're like, oh, wait, okay, thank you. Anyway, right. uh, this last one really got me too. I, those of you who remember Lord of the Rings, when, when they go into charge into battle and he turns and he goes, for Frodo. But this one, the meme says, for grandma, as he charges into the grocery store. <laughs> oh man, all right, that's good. That's, that's enough of that. That's all we have time for today. There's plenty more out there, so please go explore as much as you can. All right, Uh, So to remind us of the passage from Philippians 4, let's read through it in its entirety. Um, If you have a Bible, please pull it out, turn to Philippians 4, beginning in verse 4, uh, or a version on your phone, or if you're watching church online, you can go to the right, there's a Bible tab there, and you can look it up here. We are Philippians 4, verses 4 through 8, which says this, Rejoice in the Lord always. I say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your heart and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things." Now, you'll remember last week I mentioned that there was going to be some overlap between the the verse we studied last week and the verse we are going to study and dig into this week. So let me just remind you uh, of the verse we studied last week, which was Philippians 4, verse 6. The single sentence last week we looked and dug into what Paul says. He says, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. So as we dug in to the scripture, we talked about Paul giving us four steps when we are dealing with anxiousness or stress. Uh, The first is to pray, which the most simplest definition of praying is just to ask, which is why our acronym letter A was ask. That simply ask is step one. The second we talked about petitioning, that we don't just ask once and kind of ditch out. When we pray, we we ask him with petition, with uh, repetition. We bring others into it with energy, with fervor, with passion, with chutzpah. Those of you remember that. Uh, The third step that Paul says is that we must have a thankful heart. As we pray, as we petition, we must do so knowing as we pray, even every single good and perfect gift God has given us is from him. And then the final step was submitting our prayers to our Heavenly Father, which I'll talk more about later. Then, in the following verse, the the sentence, the verse we're going to study today, Paul tells us the outcome of when we follow those four steps. So first we learn the four steps uh, of what to do when not to be anxious, to ask, petition, have thankful hearts, and surrender. Then we learn the result of embracing those steps. Here is the result in what we're studying today. The next verse, the next sentence, verse 7 He says, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. When we ask the Lord through prayer, when we petition him in our prayer, surrounded with community, with persistence, with boldness, when we have hearts of gratitude, when we fully surrender to him, what we receive is peace. The Lord doesn't say necessarily we'll receive an answer. He doesn't say you'll receive what you want. 
He doesn't say you'll get exactly what you're praying for when you think you need it. He actually teaches us that we'll receive something so much better. Instead of just receiving circumstantial improvement to make us maybe a little bit more happy, God says he will bless bless us with something much more powerful, much more permanent, which is an internal sense of calm that cannot be affected by outside circumstances. And this teaches us a really key element to prayer. We often think of prayer as a transaction, that it's like, you know, I do this and then I get this and then I do this and then I do this. But prayer is so much more than that. Prayer is not a transaction. God is not a divine ATM where we just follow the right steps, punch in the right code, and then wait for the miracle to be dispensed. God is our heavenly Father And from the beginning of time, before time even existed, the number one thing God desires is a relationship with you and I, is for us to know and be known by him. It is quite literally the reason for everything. It's the reason for creation. God created the universe and our planet to have the perfect conditions to support human life so that when he molded us out of the dust of the ground, he could know us and we could know him. And that's evidenced by the first two humans ever to exist, Adam and Eve. It says God walked with them in the garden. He didn't want to create them like, you know, an ant farm or play in The Sims. He wanted to create them and then be with them and them with him. When he spoke to Abraham for the first time, he didn't say, hey, I'm a God and I'm going to demand all this stuff and maybe if you make me happy, I'll make it rain and kind of bless your people. He came to Abraham and spoke first and said, I want to be your God. I want you to be my people. I will make you a great nation and I want to bless you. And then throughout the Old Testament, God leads his people, his chosen people named Israel. He leads them through a pillar of smoke, a pillar of fire. He demonstrates his power through miracles because he just wanted to be with his people. There was the tabernacle, then the temple, where he said, hey, build this thing so I can come be with you. I want to be with you. He sent his only son, Jesus, whose name was Emmanuel, which means God with us, to take out the punishment and and the, the consequence of sin on his own son because he's like, I will literally sacrifice my own son. I am so not okay with not being able to be with my people and my people with me. Not only that, but all of eternity. Heaven is defined as being with God. In John 17, 3, Jesus speaking to his disciples, when he's praying for his disciples, says eternal life is that they may know you, the one true God. God is all about being with us and us being with him. And so when it comes to prayer, instead of it being some kind of vending machine, God teaches us to pray in a way that will draw us closer to him. And as we do this, we will experience this peace. I want to look at three, uh, three things about Philippians 4, 7 that I, uh, I noticed that teach us about this power of peace from this scripture. The first is that is, and if you are like a highlighter or a circler, this is, here's your moment right here. The first is that uh, we are promised the peace of God, not peace from God. If you're a highlighter, circle the word of. That is a life-changing word. This is not a peace that if we do all these things, God will like send to us. This is God's possessive, his own peace. The peace that is contained in the presence of the sovereign creator and sustainer of all things. It's not the feeling of peace or circumstantial joy. It's not the kind of peace that comes and goes. It is a peace directly from the presence of of the one true God. Again, keep in mind the goal of prayer is to draw us closer to him, to be with God. And so as we are praying, we are drawing closer to God. And as we are with God more and more, we will experience the peace of God. God can't just send us this peace via email or a lightning bolt. In order to experience this peace, we need to be close to him, in his presence, because this peace is him. A commentary I read about this passage put it so perfectly, I love it. It said, true peace is not found in positive thinking, in absence of conflict, or in good feelings. It comes from knowing that God is in control. Again, coming back to his number one desire, which is to be with us and for us to be with him. And because God is so far beyond our understanding, 
so is his peace. And this is why the second thing I want to observe about this passage is that Paul says we will experience this peace even though we won't be able to understand it. This will be a peace beyond our understanding. In fact, beyond all understanding. It's not like we, there's you know, going to be astrologists and theologians like doing tests and finally be like, we get it, guys. We, get, we figured out the equation for the peace of God. We will never get it because God is so far above us that his peace is something when we experience, it will not make sense. In a normal world, how we feel is determined by what's going on uh, around us and our outside circumstances, and we can't really control that. We can't control feeling bad when we lose a job, get broken up with, or are in an accident. We can't control feeling good when we get a raise, win a vacation, or our team wins the game. Things out of our control happen, and our natural, subconscious, uncontrollable emotions react to it, whether it's good or bad. That's life, that's logical, we all get it. We've ex- we experience it dozens of times a day, that's what happens. But receiving the peace that God has promised us will not make sense. Now, of course, there are uh, you know, a lot of things that, that we'll, we will never understand. A lot of things that don't make sense. There's, there's the Bermuda Triangle. That's a big one. That's such a big mystery to me. I want to figure that one out. I don't, I don't understand that one. Uh, there's, you know, the concept of like eternity, that we being finite human beings can, bound by time. We know nothing but the passing of time. To think of eternity outside of time like hurts the head. Or even the Trinity, like God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They're, they're one, and the same, but different, but separate, but the same and equal. Like, you know, it hurts our head to think about because we can't do that. Uh, calculus, that's another one. We'll never, never, no, never understand the calculus. The three of you that understand it, congratulations. Those are the, you guys with the blackberries. Well done. Uh, you know, why people got so into Beanie Babies in the 90s? Remember that? I'll never understand. There were like trade shows and collectors and Ebays for five. The bull one with the red bull, that was like a really hot seller. I never had it. Uh, you know, we'll never understand how anybody could think LeBron is better than Jordan. I just, I just don't understand. It's just people think that, I, I guess, some people out there. Uh, I'll never understand why sometimes I get a letter in the mail congratulating me for going to paperless billing. <laughs> I'm like, I, don't, I was like, you messed up. This was an accident. This should not have happened. Anyway, a lot of things we'll never understand, including the peace of God. And yet, it's something God promises us, something that he says as we pray As we petition, as we seek him, as we draw closer to him, suddenly we will be enveloped by a peace we will not understand, a peace that will not make sense. And this is a promise from God, regardless of if and when he answers the very thing we're praying for, regardless of when he answers the thing we're praying for, no matter what, he says, you will have peace, a peace that's immune to our circumstances. Happiness is based on circumstances, but the peace of God can remain rock solid, steady in our lives, no matter what is going on to or around us. And the final thing I want to mention about Philippians 4-7 is that this is not just a peace, uh, a, you know, a calm that's like, great, that was, that was cool to, you know, not be stressed for that moment. Uh, what Paul says in this verse is that this peace will protect us. Paul writes that this peace, the peace of God, will guard our hearts and minds because as we just learned, this peace is the presence of God himself. That he himself will guard our hearts from the things outside that might, might want to take that peace away. He himself will guard, will guard our minds from the lies that might try to take that peace away. As we experience the peace of God, we are experiencing God himself who will protect us. Um, <clears throat> Last week, I talked about being in the middle of this journey of prayer with God after my daughter Ava's accident where she suffered a traumatic brain injury. And I, you know, I, I mentioned, I don't know the end of the story. We're like in the middle of between asked and answered and, and petitioning every single day. Um, but I, would, I, can't, I can't not say this, that throughout this process, uh, I have experienced peace that doesn't make sense. Um, I have experienced peace uh, in ways that I will I, I, th- that I will never understand. This like this exact thing that Paul talks about. I look at these last eight months and say there is there is a peace here that I cannot explain. I mean, if you had come to me a year ago and told you know told me what was going to happen, um, I would have predicted you know, chaos and broken relationships and so much fear and, and, you know, so much, so much, so much damage 
Uh, but I just genuinely can tell you that throughout these last eight months, I have experienced the peace of God that doesn't make sense. Now, being, you know, genuine with you, it, there have been, you know, moments and days and seasons that have been incredibly dark uh, and difficult and unbelievably stressful. It has not been, you know, rainbows and lollipops and roller coasters. I mean, it's been uh, moments of deep, deep darkness. Um, throughout the last eight months, I've felt um, rage and depression and uncertainty on levels I never thought I would. There's been moments where it's boiled over to the point where I could barely contain it just based on everything going on around me. I've cried silent tears and sobbed loudly. I've had sleepless nights and days when all I wanted to do was sleep. I've screamed in my car, punched a pillow. Um, I even was so overwhelmed at one point with anguish and stress, I literally ripped the shirt off my body that I was so angry and so stressed. And then the next day I was kind of bummed because I really liked the shirt, but in that moment. Um, I've not handled everything perfectly by any means. Um, There's been moments when I've let my stress get the best of me and said and thought and for sure done things that I absolutely shouldn't have done. But even in these moments that have been um, difficult, as, as I've tried to handle them as wisely as possible, I still can confidently say I have had peace, overall peace. And those dark moments pass and the difficult days pass and the stress passes because even in those moments there's peace. I mean, this type of life event had, has, had, has the potential to wreck me, to break my family, destroy my marriage, obliterate my faith, shove me into an endless depression, cause damage to my son, isolate me from friendships, and so much worse. But it didn't, and I fully believe it's because the peace of God was with me, was with us, and it was protecting us. Um, God has, in his protection, blessed me and my family in just countless ways. Um, The blessing of my marriage to Lindsay, and again, we've had It's not all been easy and fun and great. We've had so many really difficult conversations. Uh, You know, I've taken my stress out on her way too many times. We've had disagreements, hard, hard conversations. But overall, without a doubt, to look at my marriage, the place that it's at now versus the place it could be after going through something like this is without a doubt the peace and protection of God himself. Um, My son, Phoenix, who's four, his... Um, resilience throughout the last eight months is, you know, he's passed off the sitters and house to house, and every time he's still got a smile on his face, and then as we're trading him off back and forth from hospitals, um, he's always still just brought joy and brought life, and now that we're all home, he loves Ava and misses Ava, and, you know, we talk about her and pray for her, and he includes her and always saves a piece of candy for her. Um, The closeness of some of my friends um, that this, as I said, could have just broken relationships driven me into driven me into isolation, but um, there's been some friendships that have just bonded and deepened so significantly. Some friendships that I had prior to this, and some that I didn't. That God has just kind of blessed me with and, and bonded those. Um, and just and and I don't have time for this, but just the countless miracles that we have seen uh, be, that God has used Ava for in this process. Countless miracles, and we have seen God's hand working in in so many ways. So for anybody that needs to hear a testimony from the year 2020 based on something written 2,000 years ago, saying as we pray, as we petition, despite our circumstances, we can have a peace that doesn't make sense, I'm here to tell you it's real, and I've experienced it. And I don't understand it, and I've not done it perfectly, but the peace of God has calmed me over the last eight months overall and protected me and my family. But before I end, uh, I need to talk about something that I believed helped usher in this peace and I believe is necessary to experience this peace. Um, Last week, as I said, there was going to be some overlap from uh, the scripture last week and the scripture this week. So let me read uh, verses 6 and 7 and I'll show you the exact overlap uh, from Philippians 4. Uh, Once again, it says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Now, the overlap happens uh, right at the end of verse 6, 
It's actually the fourth, fourth step that we talked about last week. It's five little words that are kind of simple but really, really difficult where it simply says, present your requests to God. This is talking about surrender. Um, Paul gives us steps not to be anxious. Then he gives us a promise from God that we will experience a peace beyond our understanding through these steps. But right in the middle, there's a moment, there's a transition that needs to happen, which is a full and complete to surrender to our Heavenly Father. For many of us, as we pray, as we petition, as we seek God's will, we will submit to God right up to that line of full surrender. We'll pray, we'll pray with you know, emotion and fervency and energy, and yet part of us might still hold on to certain expectations or processes or desires with tightly closed fists. But I believe in order to receive and experience the peace of God, we must surrender and surrender all of it to the Lord. In order to experience this peace, we need to let go. And that is the L in our acronym CALM. Let go. Because if we don't, we are not fully allowing God to work in our lives. Now once again, at the heart of this surrender is the character of God, which is to be with us. Um, Psalm 37 is, is oftentimes a misunderstood scripture about prayer. Uh, it says, says, verse 4 and 5 says, Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit everything you do to the Lord, trust him, and he will help you. Now, many, again, many people have read this verse and thought, oh, I just pray and God will give me the desires of my heart. The Bugatti and the vacation and that's, you know, perfect hair and skin. Like, that's great. God, give me the de- desires of my heart. However, the sandwich of that phrase, the desires of our heart, include take delight in the Lord, being with God, him with us. And the final sentence, trust him and he will help you. So when it comes to the desires of our heart, when it comes to God answering our prayer, what's necessary is being fully in God's presence and surrendering fully to him. Because as I said, the more we pray, the more time we're spending with God. And the more time we're spending with God in his presence, the more he is transforming our hearts so that our heart's desires match his heart's desires, and that is when prayers get answered. Again, we don't just send up our requests and God, you know, emails back the answer, yes, no, or, you know, I'll, I'll, it's in the mail, I'll send it to you. Prayer is about drawing closer to the Lord because as we do so, God then has the opportunity to transform us, which is something only he can do, so that our desires match his desires and we're praying for the very thing he wants and that is when his power and his miracles and his presence shows up. So as we pray, as we petition, we also must surrender. And then after we surrender, we wait. We don't wait lazily. We don't wait idly. We continue to seek, to pray, to ask, to knock, to petition, to surrender. But God's timing is perfect. And so we wait, even if we don't understand why. And man, waiting is so difficult, especially in the world that we live in today. We hate the idea of waiting. We've got fast food, we've got 4G, we've got 5G now, the speed of the internet, Amazon Prime, Google, Google, everything is instant. The other day, I literally complained uh, to Lindsay at how long it was taking me to fast forward an on-demand movie. I was like, I was like, this movie came right into my home on this rectangle, and I just, I have to wait a few minutes for it to get to the point. I was just so stupid. We just hate waiting. But here's the key. The reason that waiting is so important is because God is working in the waiting. As I said last week, uh, throughout all of this process uh, with my daughter, with Ava, three things have been true. God is good, God is present, and God is working. And God works in the waiting. Let me give you a couple perfect examples of this. One of them comes uh, from the book of Daniel. Uh, in Daniel 10, there's this, just go read Daniel 10, it's great. I'll just give you a little snippet here. Uh, so what happens in the story is Daniel uh, begins praying for something really passionately. He, he, he's fasting, he's like on his knees praying, and so he prays uh, one day, nothing happens. He does it the next day, same thing, like 
same devotion, same fervor, same energy, not, nothing happens. Does the next day. He does this for three weeks, 21 straight days with nothing. On the 21st day, an angel shows up and tells Daniel what has been going on in those 23 days. Daniel 10, starting in verse 12. Uh, the angel said, Don't be afraid, Daniel. Since the first day you began to pray for understanding and to humble yourself before your God, your request has been heard in heaven. I have come in answer to your prayer, but for 21 days, the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia blocked my way. Then Michael, one of the archangels, came to help me, and I left him there with the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia. Now I am here to explain what will happen to your people in the future, for this vision concerns a time yet to come. That's bonkers. So Daniel, the first day he prayed, God dispatched these angels to follow through on what Daniel was praying. But for three weeks, there's this battle, going, epic battle going on in the spiritual realm that Daniel had no idea about. By day like three or you know, 19, he'd have been like, all right, well, I guess you know, nothing's going on. I, you know, I've really kind of devoted myself to this prayer. I guess I better give up. But he pushed through, and on day 21, this angel said, listen, you've been praying thinking nothing was going on, but there was a ton going on that you were not even aware of. God was moving and working in the waiting. Now, when it comes to my situation, I would have, of course, Loved that Ava would have been healed three seconds after her accident happened. After the first prayer of healing for my daughter, I I wish she would have been healed. But I do have to say, since that day, I have seen God work in tens of thousands of ways in the waiting. One of the most significant ones, uh, ways that I've seen God work, is in people who hear our story and want to support us that don't know God. I just brought a few examples uh, of messages that people have sent. Uh, these are very recent. These are just from the last couple weeks that I want to share with you. This first one says, uh, it says, Hello, I've just seen your whole story. I'm not a super religious person, but I've been praying all morning for your sweet daughter and I wish I'd been praying since her accident alongside all of your wonder- wonderful supporters. I will make sure to pray every day for Ava to progress and heal. So this beautiful, wonderful person who's like, I'm not really religious, but I'm praying. Blows my mind. Here's another one. Uh, it says, hi there, I just spent the past two hours looking through your page and reading up on your beautiful baby girl, Ava, and my heart is broken for all the pain you and your family are going through. I'm ashamed to say that sadly, I have not ever been very religious. I had some difficulties in my life that sent me in a different direction and I didn't believe. But you have changed my views, and she's talking to the, all the Ava supporters. You have changed my views. And I said my first prayer there in a very long time, and I prayed to God for your little girl, and I could feel I was being listened to. It was the strangest feeling. So I just wanted you to know that I will say a prayer for her when she comes to my thoughts, which I'm sure will be a lot now that I know her journey. I'm going to start listening to and speaking to God, because after praying for your baby girl, I have a sense of well-being and peace. I believe she will be healed one day, and I believe that more now than I believe anything. Best wishes to you all. From Charlotte. And then this final one. <laughs> just this, just this, these first three words. This person says, I've never prayed, but I just wanted to tell you that I did pray for Ava the best I knew how to. Best of luck to your family during this time. Stay healthy and safe, and we're thinking of you from Cali. And these are three examples of, I mean, honestly, hundreds, hundreds of messages that I've gotten from, from people who have said, I'm not religious. This wonderful person saying, I've never prayed, and she's praying for my daughter. God is drawing people to himself through Ava in ways I would have never thought possible. And again, there are hundreds of these. I've I got messages from people who God is healing them to bring them back to church, who God is healing their relationship with family and friends and drawing them to himself. I've got messages from atheists who are like, I'm an atheist, but I prayed. And I'm like, to who? I thank you. That's amazing that God is drawing people who don't even believe in him to himself through Ava's story. I mean, would I have preferred Ava to be healed sooner? Yes. Do I want it right now? Yes, absolutely. But every single message I get just reminds me, okay, God, you're still working. You're still doing something through her story. This isn't idle waiting. We're still praying. We're still petitioning. You love Ava more than we do, but God is working in the waiting. And listen to the power of waiting. Again, waiting is not like laziness, kicking back while I said the prayer, Lord, you know, balls in your court. Listen to the power of waiting. Isaiah 40 through 31. Those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. 
They shall mount up on wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not be faint. This is a prophetic word, not speaking about what we're waiting for. This has nothing to do with what we're waiting for. This is speaking to those of us who are waiting. Those of us living between asked and answered, as Isaiah says, those who wait on God, who pray, who petition, who are thankful, who surrender wholly to him, will renew their strength. With God, our waiting isn't wasteful because it is within our waiting. Not only is God working in ways we might not ever know, but God is also strengthening us as we wait. But again, this all comes back to surrendering fully to him. And to end uh, our time together, I want to tell you the story, uh, the moment when I surrendered Ava fully to the Lord. First, I'm going to back up uh, about 20 years uh, to when I was in high school. Uh, one of the worship leaders at the high school ministry I was going to was named John Kleinpeter, and he was a fantastic, I mean, just fantastic dude. He influenced me in a number of ways. He, uh, he, he, he got a tattoo that inspired me to get my first tattoo, which, you know, if you think that's wrong, sorry. Um, he was the first, I think the first guy ever to have a faux hawk and like pull it off. He just kind of nailed it. It was legit, and so that inspired me too. Uh, but one of the if not the most significant way he influenced me was with a song that he wrote. The story of the song uh, is, is he wrote the song and it's about you know, following God through difficult circumstances um, and it's a beautiful song. He wrote it, he performed it, uh, he, you know, he, he led us in worship at this high school ministry I was a part of, debuted this song and it's just you know, so powerful, the, uh, these lyrics that he wrote. Um, and then, you know, the service ended, and he went back to his office and was packing up to go home, and his then wife walked in and informed him that she was uh, seeing somebody else and leaving him for this other person. So, that was, that was 20 years ago that he debuts this song and then walks through this incredibly painful, this song about, you know, following God even through d- difficult circumstances. Um, his life now, I mean, he's, he's gone through an incredible journey now and obviously went through a lot of pain, a lot of counseling, he's just been doing great, but now he's married, two beautiful boys, uh, yeah, uh, great, great, great. So fast forward to today, back in early September, uh, Lindsay and I went through like a brutal three days where all of Ava's doctors were pretty certain uh, she wasn't going to make it for a variety of reasons, the, the swelling in her brain, uh, she had had her breathing tube in for a long, long time. They were pretty certain she wasn't going to make it. And so we had some very, very difficult, awkward, slow, painful conversations with her doctors, with each other, with friends. Um, and, and so the, the next day was going to be the moment when they excavated her and, and took out her breathing tube. And again, the doctors very tactfully, very lovingly and gently said, we're pretty sure she's not going to be able to breathe on her own. And so, you know, this, this might be a tough day. Um, and so we had talked about it, and her and I had just come to this point where we, we surrendered her. We said, Lord, she's yours, and so uh, take her or heal her. And, and if you don't heal her immediately, we'll continue to pray and wait for that healing. But we, had, we, you know, we surrendered. So the night before this happened, I was in the hospital room with uh, four of my best friends. It was John McNary, uh, Chris Reese, who is an elder here at Heartland, uh, Joe Dam, also an elder, uh, and then Jake German, who's on Stafford. So me and, and just four of my brothers were in this room. Of course, they all knew what was going on. And so it was late, and they were getting ready to leave. And I just said, hey, can, you know, would you guys just stay? And I'm just going to pray for Ava before what's going on tomorrow. And they said, yeah. So uh, we gathered around Ava, and um, I, I, just, I just broke, like in a good way. I just started bawling and praying fervently for Ava's healing, uh, God's presence, you know, peace. And then I got to a point where I'd finished praying for what I wanted. And then I said the chorus to the song called But If Not that John Klein Peter wrote and I heard 20 years ago. And the chorus simply says, but if not, I'll still call you Father. I'll still call you Lord. I'll still sing your praise forever no matter what life brings. And for me, this was, this was the moment that I truly just let go. No more expectations or, you know, it's got to be my way or when I think or how I think or what I think. That was just the moment where, you know, as I'm weeping, my closest friends around me, praying over my daughter, quoting this chorus of a song I heard 20 years ago that was such a part of 
uh, you know, this, this gentleman who influenced me so much, such a part of his story was now a huge part of my story. Um, I had the chance actually this past week to connect with John and tell him that story, how meaningful those lyrics meant to me and, and that moment with Ava. And as I was thinking about today and thinking about what I wanted to share, I asked him if he would be okay if I uh, played that song um, to end my teaching. And he said, absolutely, you know, I'd love for you to do that. So I would like to close the, this sermon by playing you this song called But If Not that I heard 20 years ago and was the ending to my prayer of when I fully surrendered Ava to the Lord. If today brings only pain and sorrow And my heart says there'll be no tomorrow I lift my hands to you And ask with my small voice That you would come and save me I know it's your choice, but if not I'll still call you Father, I'll still call you Lord, I'll still sing your praise forever, no matter what life brings. If today brings only persecution, for giving you my life and my heart to your son. If tonight my eyes close and I am alone, I'll ask you to comfort me, ask you to send your angels down, but if not, I'll still call you Father and I'll still call you Lord. I'll still sing your praise forever, no matter what life brings. I'll still call you Father, I'll still call you Lord. I'll still sing your praise forever, no matter what life brings. No matter what life brings. No matter what life brings. Well, as we close, I simply want to add that not only was that night when Dugan fully surrendered Ava and fully let go, not only was that night a night that he will never forget, not only was that a moment that will forever mark him, that was also an evening that I'll never forget. It was a moment that marked me, and I'm sure it also marked the other guys who were there in the room with us that night as well. And what I simply want to encourage those of you with who are currently waiting on God, who are currently praying for that peace that passes all understanding, is that not only will God use this time to do something inside of you, even in the midst of your waiting, God is using you. He is, he is working through you in the lives of other people for his glory. And I want to encourage you that your faith will have ripple effects that will leave a legacy for all of eternity. As you continue to wait on the Lord, as you continue to come before him with prayers and petitions with thanksgiving, know that in the midst of this journey that you are a part of, that God is with you and that God will be with you, that God is going to do incredible things in your life, but he is also going to use you in the lives of other people. He will change them for all times because of your faith. And I want to encourage you to find peace and comfort and joy in that. As we close our time together today, we want to finish not so much with a worship song that I want to invite us all to sing, but almost more of a, a classical benediction. I want to invite you to let the words of this song just kind of wash over you and sink in. It's the lyrics of a song that say, that, that, that pray, may the presence of God go before you, go behind you, be beside you and all around you. And that's my prayer for you. That's my prayer for our church and especially those of you who are going through a difficult season today that God's presence would be with you in a way that passes all human understanding and that your faith would change the situation and bring glory to him. 
It's in Jesus' name that we pray for that. Amen.
so glad that you chose to join us today. As we said earlier in the service, if you need anything, um, whether that's uh, somebody to walk through this season with you, maybe it's a prayer request, maybe you simply want a calm bracelet and you haven't gotten one yet, shoot us an email at info at heartlandsunprairie.com and we will get back to you as soon as we possibly can. And with that said, have a great rest of your weekend. We'll see you back here on Wednesday evening for Community Chapel. Thanks for joining us. Thank you.